Hello, everyone. I am Samira Bazorgi, Head of Engagement for the Hoover Institution Library and Archives, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's talk on Lou Henry Hoover in celebration of her 150th anniversary of her birth on March 29th, 1874. This talk is presented in conjunction with a number of other exhibits and activities that were held on campus um, on Lou Henry Hoover's bir uh, birthday, March 29th, um, including two small exhibits at the Branner Library and Geology Corner that are open through the spring quarter and a story map detailing Lou Henry Hoover's life. All of these activities and more are shared on the URL that will be shared in the chat later in this talk and will accompany the recording of this program when it's posted on our YouTube channel. I want to thank the cross campus team headed by Julie Sweetheart and Singer, as well as Alma Parada, Claudia Baroni, Josh Schneider, Marissa Reeve, Zach Nunn, and our own Elena Danielson for their partnership and passion for sharing Lou Henry Hoover's story, and Stanford professor of anthropology, Tanya Lorman, who's the current resident of the Lou Henry Hoover House, had graciously shared the home with us and helped pass the torch for our incoming president. I'd also like to thank Director Rice and the Board of the Library and Archives for all their support of our programming. Before I introduce our speaker, I wanted to take a few moments to share that the Hoover Institution Library and Archives was founded by Herbert Hoover when on April 22nd, 1919, he sent a telegram establishing a collection on war at his alma mater, Stanford. So we at the Library and Archives um, profession are recognize the importance of a telegram is not only uh, who sent it, but also to whom it was addressed. And in this case, our founding telegram was sent to um, Lou Henry Hoover to execute this important mission. So with that, um, I am going to stop sharing my screen and introduce uh, our speaker, Annette Dunlap, who is joining us from the other coast. Welcome, Annette. Uh, Annette Dunlap is an independent scholar and journalist. She's author of Frank, the Story of Frances Folsom Cleveland, America's Youngest First Lady, The Gambler's Daughter, A Personal and Social History, and Charles Gates Dawes, A Life. Her most recent publication is A Woman of Adventure, The Life and Times of First Lady Lou Henry Hoover, which was published in 2022. There will be time for questions and answers after Annette's presentation, so please feel free to use the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of the Zoom screen to submit your questions at any time. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Annette. Just take it away. Thank you so much, Samira. And thanks to um, all of the many people who got involved with um, this, creating the opportunity for me to make this presentation. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get us started. Uh, let me just give a couple of caveats about the presentation for this evening. Uh, one is that we will um, be focusing primarily on Lou's life at Stanford in Palo Alto, both as a student and then uh, through her uh, adult marriage and adult life and the building of the Lou, what is known as the Lou Hoover Henry House. So there will be gaps in terms of my presentation. If you're interested in other aspects of Lou's life, uh, in addition to the biography, which uh, you've seen a copy of on the introductory screen, there are a couple of presentations that I have made at the Hoover Library and available on C-SPAN on their website under my name that are available to you to view, and that will give you a more comprehensive presentation view of Lou's life. To get us started, let's go ahead and look at a quick abbreviated timeline of Lou's life. Again, gaps in here. So what's getting focused on are things that will be highlighted in more detail throughout the presentation this afternoon. Lou was born uh, March 29, 1874. So that was 150 years ago, which has precipitated the celebration of this year. Of course, Bert was also born in 1874. He was born in August. So there's a six month age difference between the two. Lou is the older of the two, of the couple. Uh, Lou initially graduated from San Jose State Normal School in 1893. I'll talk a little bit in the presentation about what happened with her attempts to begin a teaching career. And then she enrolled in Stanford University as its first female geology student in the fall of 1894 and graduated in June 1898. 
As most people know, this is where she met Herbert Clark Hoover, whom I'm going to refer to as Bert throughout most of this presentation, because that's how I have been thinking about him for the last five, six, or seven years since I began work on a biography of Lou. The couple were married on February 10th, 1899 at the Henry's home in Monterey, California. The two of them received the first gold medal that was awarded by the Mining and Metallurgical Society of America for tran translation of De Re Metallica. And while that's not necessarily specific to their lives in California, it's a significant milestone in terms of their professional accomplishments, in terms of loose professional accomplishments in this field, which was still you know, primarily populated by men, but it also meant a turning point in the nature of their marriage. Throughout the following the ensuing years, 1912 to 1929, she assumed an enormous number of leadership roles, including the Girl Scouts. My opinion with her involvement with the Girl Scouts is I don't think the Girl Scouts would still be an organization today if it had not been for her money and her organizational talents and her superb networking. She was First Lady of the United States from 1929 to 1933. And she retired, as I say in quotes, to Stanford, her Stanford home in 1933. And we'll be looking at some of the things she was doing from 1933 until she left her uh, the home in Palo Alto at the end of 43, 10 years later. And she died on January 7th, 1944 in New York City. So a couple of things about Lou's background that are important for our conversation and also explain her interest in geology is um, Lou was the older of two girls. She had a sister, Jean, who was, um, I want to say, nine years younger than she. And um, if you want an example of what we now today call a dad girl, it was Charles Henry, her father. I mean, from the beginning, um, Charles Henry really had uh, no desire to treat his elder daughter with kid gloves, although I think her mother might have preferred it, but she let her father teach Lou how to hunt, how to fish. Lou was an ex expert horsewoman. She absolutely adored and loved the outdoors. And here she is uh, at a, a little camp out with her father. Uh, she is the one who is sitting here with the kind of beret type hat to um, her father's right, our left, uh, this is her sister, Jean, and this is an un unidentified friend. Lou's father took an interest in a gold mine that was on Mount Gleason uh, in Acton, California, and he gave a share of that mine to Lou. I have looked at this picture numerous times. I believe I may also have included it in the book, but today when I was studying it, preparing for our, our talk this afternoon, I took a really, really careful look uh, what's in this background. And this is all the mining equipment. And one of the things that Lou talked about was leading this um, burrow around the wind, what was called the wind, which was also the windless, which was pretty heavy duty physical work. And the purpose of the whim, whim was to extract the materials from the actual mine. She also descended into the mine with her father to inspect it, and she would visit the mines around the area, and the miners there would also allow her to inspect their mines. When she went to China with her new husband, the attitude about women in the mines was really different because they believed that women brought evil spirits with them, and they used to perform what was their version of cleansing ceremonies after she would go into a mine with Bert to inspect it, to get rid of any demons or evil spirits she might have left behind. You may also note the rifle here. As I mentioned earlier, she was a crack shot. She, her father taught her how to kill and prepare rabbits for eating. And so she also enjoyed a little bit of hunting as well. While Lou did graduate from San Jose Normal School, she actually started at Los Angeles Normal School, which because her family was still living in the Whittier area, and she thrived there. This is a copy of their catalog from the 1891-92 uh, school year. And right there is her name. And this would be the last year that she attended uh, Los Angeles State. Her parents moved to Monterey uh, in the spring of 1892. 
And some of her uh, living accommodations were a little undesirable. And, and the travel between Monterey and Los Angeles at that time was not as simple as it would be today. It was a nine or a 10 hour trip and also involved taking a boat. So she transferred somewhat reluctantly to San Jose Normal School. When she graduated, she attempted to find a teaching position. Uh, the school administrators wanted to have her teach the younger grades, probably because of her own youth. That was not what she wanted. As she said in one letter, I hate babies. And um, when she was unable to get the kind of teaching position that she wanted, she began to attend some what we would today call continuing education seminars that were being offered by Stanford. And a set of those seminars was offered by John Casper Branner, who was hired to create the geology department at Stanford. And so Lou heard the lectures about Stanford, excuse me, about geology from Branner. She wrote him and asked him if Stanford would accept a woman into its geology program. Branner responded that he most certainly would. And he was very much a mentor to her as well as to her future husband, Herbert Hoover. So as you can see, because you've probably had time to read this screen, Lou wanted to get out in the field and do field work. That's And I purposely included the information about her loving to be outdoors and her working the mind so that you would be able to see that this was very much a part of her upbringing and a part of how she saw herself. But unfortunately, the sexism at the time was such that nobody was comfortable with a woman working out in the field. And so she was given the job of classifying rocks in Brainer's lab for the summer while the men were out doing the what she would have considered to be the more interesting work. Curiously, when she wrote a letter of complaint to that effect to her parents, her mother responded that if she didn't like it well enough, she could just come home and entertain her father for the summer, and of course they would pay her for that. Now, either Florence knew her daughter very well and figured that, that was enough of a threat to get her to quit complaining, or Florence really did want her to come home. But in any event, Lou decided that cataloging rocks in Branner's lab was a lot more uh, appealing than going back home and having to entertain her father, even though they had a very, very close relationship. Lou was involved in a lot of activities at Stanford. Here she is with the uh, Zoology Club. She is the person holding the geology pick. And one of the things that's kind of interesting about Lou's involvement in these clubs and these outings is that her mother Florence wanted to know if they were being well chaperoned. Well, chaperoned in Florence's mind was not that there were other female classmates on the trip with them, but that there were the wives of the male professors also going out and attending the, uh, being a part of these outings. Uh, Lou, if she responded specifically to her mother, uh, that letter was not available to me when I was doing my research. But it lets you know somewhat what Florence's mindset was, even though she had agreed to have her daughter uh, attend Stanford and study geology. Lou was a member of Kappa Kappa Gamma sorority, and uh, curiously enough, Kappa Gappa Gamma KKG was the um, the first sorority to establish a house on the Stanford campus. And this is a picture of Lou in front of the house. She was also active in the geology club in 1897. She was listed as a member in 1898. She became president. This follows um, very much a pattern that she had already established in high school and in, at Los Angeles Normal, where she had organized what was called an Agassiz Club. And this was for Louis Agassiz, and that my pronunciation may be wrong, but the spelling is A-G-A-S-S-I-Z. -S and Agassiz was a Swiss scientist who promoted the observation of nature and making note of one's observations for the study of science in a more holistic type of manner. And he had done quite a bit of lecturing throughout the United States, including at Harvard 
and had promoted the start of these clubs throughout the country. Lou initiated one of those clubs when she was in normal school, and here she is as president of the geological club. So again, following a pattern of leadership that she exhibited at, at a relatively young age, and as we know from her life, she would continue uh, throughout her life until the very end. And I do not have the exact location of uh, this photograph. My best guess is that these may be some sorority sisters who were graduating with her. Um, so she is the one here on the left with some of her sister graduates. So Lou knew, of course, Stanford was a relatively small school at the time. Um, it was um, not opened. I, not going to even say the opening date because I didn't write it down. I want to say it opened in 1891, and I know somebody's going to correct me if I'm if I'm a year off, which I might be. But um, visits to David Starr Jordan, who was the president of the university, were not uncommon. Uh, undergraduates were welcomed to attend teas and various events at the president's home. And so David Starr Jordan knew who this Lou Henry was. And in the moral equivalent of what you would call drawing straws, um, Lou ended up being able to sit next to David Starr Jordan at the third annual luncheon of the Alumni Association. And he doodled on her program. So these are drawings that David Starr Jordan made on Lou Henry's, um, excuse me, I have a very, very touchy mouse, um, on Lou Henry's program for that event. And one of the things I want to point out to you, if you are able to make it out, is this signature right here reads Gregory. So Lou explains about all of these drawings, and I'll come back to this in a minute. She sent a letter to her very, very good friend, Evelyn White, uh, whom she had met at Stanford, who was in the graduate school at the time. And she said um, that she, and she sent this program to um, Evelyn and asked to have it back. And she explains that the first is a headpiece because it's principally the head. The last piece is a tail because the tail is last. The second one illustrates chicken salad the third is just nothing, and the frontispiece is a beast. And so when Lou asked David Starr Jordan to sign it, he wrote Gregory on it. The curious other aspect of this letter is that the way that she opens it to uh, Evelyn is to say, well, here I am, I've had my degree for several weeks, and um, I have my A.B., and oh, how I wish the A.B. stood for a boy. And the reason is because um, the market for jobs was already tight, and she had a very, very low probability of being able to find employment as a geologist. This is a copy of her diploma. You can see that it's signed by David Starr Jordan and John C. Branner. And she is the first woman to graduate with a degree in geology from Stanford. She is not the first woman in the United States to get a degree. Uh, there was another woman on the East Coast, Florence Bascom, who actually earned a PhD in geology and she was doing university teaching, which is what Branner was trying to push Lou toward and Lou really wanted field work. She wanted to be out in the field. She did not want to teach classroom, not even college students. So in a, a courtship that was kept relatively quiet, um, because if you read uh, some of Lou's correspondence during her time at Stanford, she dated, she went out in large groups, she had good relationships with um, men, but uh, there was this relationship with Bert that was kept quiet and low key. And after he landed a lucrative job with Bewick Mooring, uh, which was based in London, which is where most of the mining companies were based at the time, he sent her a um, telegram and asked, he said, going to China, will you go with me? 
And she replied by telegram with one word, yes. So the interesting thing about that telegram is that the postmaster seeing it to Lou thought it was a one man writing to another man. And so the telegram was posted on the post office bulletin board for the entire world to see. The couple were married on February 10th. They left uh, for San Francisco at two in the afternoon after the ceremony was performed. And the very next day they left on the USS Coptic to uh, sail first to Japan and then on to China. So as I said, we're gonna do a little bit of fast forwarding, but about 1906 or 1907, uh, Bert and Lou started to uh, get the idea of working on a translation of the book De Re Metallica. So Georges Agricola, which was actually a um, pen name, Agricola would come from the word for agriculture, um, had written what to, even today is considered the seminal work about mining. And, um, but more, more and more people were uh, not knowledgeable. That was very grammatically incorrect. Sorry about that. A lot of people could not read the Latin. Part of the reason was they weren't schooled in Latin, but the other reason was that uh, Agricola made up a lot of the terms that he put into his book. So what uh, Bert and Lou did was Lou had the skill in the translation. She spoke several languages, including Latin. She was able to parse through a lot of the Latin that Agricola had written. And Bert, because of his extensive mining knowledge, was able to figure out a lot of what Agricola meant. So between the two of them, they essentially, it wasn't just a translation per se, even though that's what it says, but it is also um, figuring out, figuring out or putting either figuring out a puzzle or putting together a puzzle, whichever way you want to think about it. But they puzzled this out. It was published for them. If you look at the bottom, it says published for the translators by the mining magazine that was owned by a very, very close friend of theirs, um, Edgar R Ricard. And this book was what we would call self-published. Um, it was published on extremely high quality paper with a beautiful binding. Uh, the, Ho the Hoovers wanted this to look as close to what a book would have looked like published in the 1500s. And then they gave copies to many of their friends. So we will fast forward again. Um, so I am skipping over some pretty dramatic and traumatic events during World War I, which I apologize for. But again, we want to spend more time looking at what Lou um, did at Stanford. So Lou really started kind of this cross-country commuting by train between Palo Alto and Washington, D.C. Um, Bert had been appointed the food administrator when the United States entered World War I. So that appointment came in April of 1917. So at that point, um, the Hoovers closed up Red House, which was a house that they had been renting in London since 1903. And Lou looked for a place in Washington that they could make their home base. And she liked the Charles Francis Adam house, Adams House because it was um, conducive to a lot of entertaining. And throughout their entire married lives, Lou was a, a tremendous hostess. She had people in both for breakfast and for dinner almost every night. A lot of the reason for that was she realized it was healthy for Bert to have the stimulation of other people. She also used it as networking opportunities for herself. So she had Edgar Ricard handle the leasing for this while she went back to California in the hope of starting her own, uh, the building of the house that she wanted. Um, in all honesty, she really wanted to come back to California. She wasn't exactly thrilled about Bert taking this food administrator position. She wanted to settle in Palo Alto. He had been offered opportunities uh, to teach or to consult from Palo Alto, 
but Bert liked the stimulation of the East Coast and he wanted to have uh, involvement in, in politics. He felt that this would give him more meaning to his life after making quite a bit of money in the mining industry. So the Hoovers not only had rented the home in Washington, but they also rented this home at 746 Santa Inez Street. And the original builder of the house had not completed it when Lou leased it, excuse me, purchased it from him. And so she ended up completing this particular house. The curiosity on this house is that she retained ownership of it and she turned it into a rental property. And she asked Burge Clark, who would be the um, architect, primary architect for the house that she did build, um, to manage the property for her. And when he went through the property, when she first started to want to go ahead and lease it out, he did what we would today call a punch list of what needed to be done to upfit or upgrade the house. And Lou, who was extremely extravagant as a philanthropist, was also very mindful of every penny of her expenditures. And she insisted on having receipts and justification for every dime that was spent on uh, upfits or upgrades to this house. One of the other curiosities is that when Lou was told that they, she needed to put a new furnace in the home, she and Burge asked her whether or not she wanted coal or an upgrade to oil. She said, put in a coal furnace, which would be less expensive. And if the tenants want to put in an oil furnace, they can absorb that on their own. So that was not atypical. Uh, Lou had a couple that she wanted to have come work for her, but she wasn't even willing to pay their train fare to come across. She figured if they want to work for her, they can eat the train fare themselves. So that kind of thinking was not unusual for Lou. And that was a lot of how she had the money to do some of the things she did. Um, one of the things that in this time period is that Lou was really trying to go ahead and get her own home built. And she had contracted with Louis Mulgard, who was a local Palo Alto architect, and asked him to draw up some plans. And she had given him somewhere between a fifty and $60,000 budget. And Mulgard breached the um, confidentiality and told people that he was working on this home for the Hoovers and what the potential cost of the house was going to be. Well, the average cost of a home in the United States at that time was $3,000. It was also a time when people were being asked to cut back on what they ate so there could be enough food to feed the troops, and it just did not sit well. So Lou rescinded her contract with Mulgard and then had to go ahead and, and I'll come back to that picture in a minute, had to uh, come out and give a statement saying it was totally untrue that they were planning to build a home on San Juan Hill. And this is an article that appeared in the Daily Palo Alto um, April 4th, 1918, to that effect. This home, 739 Santa Inez Street, was a home that the Hoovers purchased in 1920. And it was going to be what would be known as their Blair House. Uh, Blair House is the home in Washington, D.C., where guests often stay who um, have are going are visiting the White House, but are not going to actually stay in the White House. And so the Hoovers were looking for a place in Palo Alto where they could have people stay who were going to come and visit them. Now, when Lou built the home that's at on Marotta Street, um, it was also set up to be able to have uh, guests, but they retained ownership of that home as well. Again, mindful of the fact that um, Lou was a tremendous hostess and people were welcome to come and visit them and that they were more than willing to um, have them accommodate them and have them spend the night or some, several nights and, and eat with them. So Lou, once again, wanted to have what we would call her dream home. And she used to do drawings as a youth, and she kind of 
went back to a lot of her drawing prowess and she started to put together ideas for what she wanted the house to look like. And so this is just one example of her um, drawings, which she consulted with Arthur Clark, who was uh, a professor at Stanford, as well as his son, Burge. Now, Lou had a strong relationship with the Clarks because Arthur and Grace, uh, Burge's parents, had also kept Herbert, the older of the two Hoover sons, um, when Lou went to Europe to be with um, Bert after he started working on the Commission for the Relief of Belgium, which was his efforts to get food to the starving Belgians after they had been overrun by Germany. And um, Alan, the younger son, stayed with Lou's parents, but the, the Clarks kept um, Herbert for them. So she had a, a close, very close-knit relationship with them, and she certainly trusted the Clarks to maintain her confidentiality. And if you have not had an opportunity to look through Paul Turner's book, Mrs. Hoover's Pueblo Walls, and have an interest in what her sketches look like, Turner has done a marvelous job of collecting those sketches and including them in the, um, in the book. And because I have seen a lot of Lou's handwriting from doing my research, these numbers pretty much look like her figuring things out. I do not think that those are um, Clark's writings. I think that those are Lou's um, computations. And of course, as most of you know, this is the completed home. Now, some of you may or may not know of the tragedy that occurred uh, here not too long after Lou moved into the house, and that is when her sister Jean's youngest child, Walter, was found drowned in the swimming pool. And um, he was found by an employee of the Hoovers, and efforts were made to resuscitate him, but unfortunately he had been, um, he had been in the water way too long and there was no way in which they could bring him back. So you know, a very sad and unfortunate tragedy associated with a home that Lou had excitedly looked forward to occupying and to hosting people in. One of the other things that Lou was involved in um, on the Stanford campus was to um, work with Burge Clark on the creation of what has become known as Mrs. Hoover's Cottages. And this is one of the sketches of those cottages. And Burge Clark liked an eclectic um, design style. And if you look through the um, historic houses, books um, one and two are available online. And there's a nice article about Burge Clark's architectural style. Um, he liked different types of styles and he um, designed differently. So he did not have just one set cookie cutter look for his homes. The perp Lou's initial intention was to have these homes built in order to house professors because there was a housing shortage at Stanford. But what ended up happening is that a number of the people who moved into these houses were um, women who were executive secretaries or management of the cafeterias. And Lou found that somewhat interesting. But the other side of that is that whether she intended for these homes to be occupied by these women or not, it's a curious parallel to what she had done in Washington, D.C., because once she got set up in Washington, she noticed that a lot of women had come to Washington, D.C. when the men had gotten drafted to go to Europe after U the U.S. entered World War I in April of 1917. And so she purchased a home on Jackson Place that she turned into um, a safe place for women to come to eat their meals, to socialize. And she also built, uh, excuse me, purchased a second home to provide safe boarding for them. So this, whether she intended for these homes to be for that purpose or not, it's a, it's curious that there is this parallel between things that she was doing to help professional women in Washington during the time we were in the war, involved with the war effort, and then what was going on with these homes that she um, had built in the early 1920s. So we're going to... Um, 
kind of skip forward uh, 13 years, but you can't go without saying that uh, in addition to having been first lady of the United States, when Lou was, excuse me, when Burt was appointed Secretary of Commerce by Warren Harding in uh, 1921, Lou decided it was time to let go of the lease at the Charles Francis Adams home. And she purchased uh, here in our upper left corner, 2300 S Street, which is also the same block where Woodrow Wilson had moved to. And there were some prominent journalists who became friends of the Hoovers uh, also um, lived on this street. And this uh, building is now the embassy for Myanmar. Lou uh, retained the deed of this home until her death, um, at which point um, Bert handled it and had the just had it just um, sold. So Lou purchased this home for a lot of the reasons she wanted the Charles Francis home, uh, Adam's home, and that was because it was very conducive to having guests come and stay conducive to having people come for meals. And there was quite a bit of entertaining and policy making here done, done in this home, including the creation of the um, National Amateur Athletic Federation, which was Lou's effort to promote sports and physical activity among both men and women and to try to come against what was becoming increasingly the professionalization of sports and that study in and of itself is worthy of uh, probably its own um, small short talk, which doesn't fit in with what we are doing today. But I'll throw that out there for some interested person. So the Hoovers were in the White House 1929 to 1933. Uh, Bird, of course, lost to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Lou sensed that there was going to be a loss. She had a letter to Allen that said, uh, be prepared for a stunning defeat. She pretty much expected it. And so the Hoovers closed up their Washington, D.C. lives, and they uh, boarded a train on March 4th, 1933. Bert boarded a train with his older son, Herbert, and went to New York City. Lou boarded a train with her son, Alan, and came back to her home in Palo Alto. Lou had already written Alan that she knew that Bert was not going to make Palo Alto his base of operation. As she put in the letter, he needed to be on the East Coast where he could have the stimulus and the interaction with people of that caliber. And so they led these cross-country lives with Bert based on a set of apartments in the Waldorf Astoria and Lou living her life um, in, in Palo Alto. And one of the things that Lou did as a result of uh, moving back to Palo Alto and being completely out of the limelight was to get back to what she loved most, which was to get back out there and camp and be out in the outdoors. So this is a photograph of her with two friends who um, took a pack trip together to Nevada Falls. And the gentleman that is on the right was the guide whose name was Bill. And um, the two friends, which we can see in this Christmas card were Augusta Hart and Helen Means along with Lou. Lou also took her eldest granddaughter, her uh, son Herbert's daughter, on a horseback camping trip along with another friend who had been her one of her secretaries in the White House years, Philippa Harding Butler, and uh, Mrs. Butler's uh, daughter. So the four of them went also on a horseback camping trip as well. As the Roosevelt administration continued um, to become more familiar to Americans and people saw how FDR was going to administer the country. There was increasing concern among the Hoovers and among some of their close friends that the country was gravitating towards socialism. And I realized when I use that term today that I have to be very careful because it has a somewhat different connotation now than it did at the time. So I think probably uh, in the short time that I've got left with you, 
What I would want to say is when you think about socialism as it was, as it was perceived in 1933, you need to remember that that was also the comparable term that was applied to what had happened in uh, what was then being called the Soviet Union. Russia, of course, had had what we today often call communist takeover, but this was also very much socialism. You also had the rise of Hitler, and that was uh, considered to be socialism, Nazi uh, German for the National uh, Socialist Party, so to speak. You had the thought of socialism with Mussolini in Italy. You had the aftermath of World War I, which really never got fully settled, as most students of history know, and many believe that it laid the groundwork for how we ended up with World War II. So when you read about the concerns about socialism, you, know, you need to put that 1920s, 1930s hat on. You also need to remember that the Hoovers especially had seen many horrors of what had been done in the name of socialism across Europe through World War I, and that informs a lot of their thoughts. This is a letter that Lou sent to her friend, Agnes Morley, where she talks about a conversation that she and Bert had with two Stanford uh, male, male Stanford students who were sons of friends of theirs. And I circled at the top of the second page something that I thought was interesting. And I apologize for reading to you, but I think it captures who Lou is in so many different ways. It's her tone, it's her, her, it's her wit, it's her sense of humor, um, as well as her concerns. So they, meaning the boys, frankly, had never heard of our old friend, the Bill of Rights. They hadn't the faintest idea of what the First Amendments to the Constitution, nor how they came to be incorporated, although they did confess to having read it. Constitution in high school, but not, excuse me, having read the Constitution in high school, but not to really having studied it. They knew absolutely nothing of the principles which Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Hamilton, and even Franklin discussed at such length, nor how they developed until the present day. And I think what's sad is we could probably make the same statement today um, about civics education. So it doesn't look like a whole lot has changed. And this was a warning that was being issued in 1934. So again, Lou, does a, Lou had edited Burt's books on mining she edited this book that he wrote in 1934, which was to address the concerns that they um, had about the country gravitating towards socialism under FDR. And Lou sent this book out. Agnes Morley, the woman to whom the previous letter was addressed, was one of the people. But there were other people that Lou sent this out to asking for some feedback to help Burke get this book prepared for publication, which you can see was published in 1934. And then Lou became active and involved with the um, friend, starting what was known as the Friends of Music at Stanford University. And this is a list of the friends who were donors. And these are people that Lou wrote to personally and asked them to help get this organization started. It was started um, partly because Lou had hosted a number of musicals as the First Lady in the White House. She had come to know Elizabeth Sprague Coolidge, who was a concert pianist and a philanthropist who wanted to bring chamber music to the West Coast. And over time, Lou was able to get this organization started. Now, uh, Ray Lyman Wilbur was president of... Um, the university at the time. And while he was not opposed to the idea of Friends of Music, he kind of gave Lou some pushback saying he really didn't know where to put, where to designate the pot of money for this. And she, Lou being Lou prevailed on him and would not let him just let it go. And so she uh, continued to, she continued to persist it originally started at Mills College, but she wanted to get it over to Stanford, and she persisted and finally was successful in getting it off the ground in, I believe, it was 1939. She also wanted to get a music curriculum started at Stanford. Stanford did not have a music school, 
And this is a letter to a good friend, Sue Dyer, that she had gone to undergraduate with at Stanford and had retained friendship over the years. And she, Sue is writing to Lou saying, I want to let you know of an effort to get a chamber music uh, course um, into the curriculum at Stanford. And we've got one getting ready to get started in the fall. Lou was the first woman commencement speaker at Stanford uh, on June 15th, 1941. She was, it was the 50th anniversary of the founding of the school. And um, she challenged the students to think about where they would be 50 years from that date and how much Stanford would have influenced the decisions that they made. Uh, curiously, Bert was not present at this um, at her talk, although he did come and give a talk to the university a couple of weeks later. And Lou was given designation of honorary fellow as uh, in recognition of her work and also as an honor for being the commencement speaker. By the way, Stanford would not have a female speaker again until 35 years later. Lou was also a trustee at several colleges, including Whittier College and Mills College. And some final accolades. One of the things that Lou became noted for in her post-White House life was to have Stanford women to tea at her home and to mentor them and to encourage them in the sciences. This was a continuation of what she had done in Washington, where she would bring women who had been recommended to her, who had graduated from Stanford to Washington, hire them as her secretaries and pay them, but also introduce them to new careers and help them network so that they could have um, a, a more uh, successful professional life than if they were left on a, uh, left alone to, to figure it out on their own. Lou uh, lobbied for and was successful in having women teach the PE classes to other women instead of having male PE teachers. She advocated for the creation of, of physical therapy curriculum, which was a very new um curriculum and field of study in the late 30s, early 40s. And after she stopped her work with the Girl Scouts, she became actively involved with the Salvation Army, including doing clothing drives and fundraising to help them handle the what was going on in Europe with the start of World War II, which of course began there in the 1930s. The U.S. didn't enter until 1941, late 41, December as we know with um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, which by the way, her sister Jean and Jean's daughter Janet were at Pearl Harbor when uh, it was bombed and were required to stay there for two or three years before they were allowed to leave. So these are some of the sources that I used. And I want to thank you for the opportunity to share Lou with you this afternoon. And I believe we are going to be taking some questions. Thank you, Annette. I was frantically writing things down because I have I learned so much, even um, after reading your book, uh, you added some, some great, 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 great um, factoids here for us to learn more about um, Lou Henry Hoover. Um, so uh, for anyone joining us or still with us right now, you please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen um, to submit a question. So to give people a chance to, to have a question, I wanted to just you know ask you how what got you interested in, in, in writing this book and studying Lou Henry Hoover? Well, um, as my acknowledgments say, this book really owes a debt to Michelle Gullion, who is the um, archivist at the National First Lady's Library in Canton, Ohio. After I finished the Francis Cleveland book and had graciously been invited to speak at the National First Lady's Library, Michelle spoke to me and said, you really need to do a book on Lou Henry Hoover. I think she's an undersung uh, first Lady. And so I learned that there were study grants through the Hoover Library at, in West Branch, and I applied for one the first year and I was turned down. And so I thought, okay, well, that means I'm not supposed to do it. But um, Lou was not going to leave me alone. 
So I had that little bit of a nagging thing in the back of my mind. So I reapplied the next year and I was accepted. And then once I got involved with reading her correspondence and really, really getting to know her, as my husband says, I think you love Lou more than you loved Frank. And you loved Frank an awful lot. And Frank being the nickname for Francis Cleveland, in case you're wondering who Frank is. <laughs> That's great. Um, a question actually from uh, Julie Sweetkind Singer, who was the catalyst that brought us all together to um, have this cross-campus uh, celebration uh, for Lou's sesquicentennial. She asked, did the Hoovers and John Casper Branner part ways? Um, Lou mentions in a letter when she went to England during World War I that she didn't want the boys to go to Branner and his wife, Susan, if she died while there. So they had been so close during her time at Stanford, it seems odd that she specifically didn't want to have them involved. Right. And I would point out that Lou also did not want her own parents to have the boys in that same letter. Um, and she also did not want Evelyn White to have the boys because she thought that Evelyn would not be good at raising boys into men. And so I think some of this probably had more to do with age and attitude and what, um, Lou really wanted for her sons if she wasn't going to be the one to be there and rear them. Um, so I do not think that they parted ways. At least I never found any evidence of it. I think more Lou was trying to think about who would set the kind of example for the boys that she wanted them to have if Bert and she were not going to be able to continue parenting. In other words, lost their lives crossing the Atlantic. Another question. Um... What was Lou Henry Hoover's relationship to the women rights activists at the time? Right. That's a good question that comes up on a somewhat regular basis, and it's a complicated one. Um, Lou wrote uh, themes in high school uh, saying that women were treated um, about uh, at the same level as jailbirds were uh, treated, and yet... A man could get out of jail and go back and vote, or a woman who had never broken the law couldn't. And that that's an Annette Dunlap paraphrase, but you get the gist. Um, and so Lou very much believed in full equality of women. I think the mentoring that she did for women and some of the correspondence that she had to promote women in science careers, especially, uh, indicates that. But either I think it was a combination of her own reticence, what was um, more comfortable for her. Again, she used to, the Girl Scout organization as an opportunity to promote self-reliance among girls in a way that was important to her. And also probably politically because of Bert's career, she was hamstrung in terms of how outspoken she could be. But um, on, the, on the quiet side, what she was doing privately, she was a strong advocate for uh, women's right to vote and, of course, other rights as well. Um, it's just that she was not the one taking a lot of the direct hits that the people that we call suffragists were taking. Our uh, curator, um... Jean Cannon asked a question. We at the archives have an amazing dress um, that was once owned by Lou Henry Hoover. Um, where did Lou get her sense of fashion? <laughs> I am laughing because there are um, letters from Florence to Lou during Lou's time at Stanford chastising her for wearing ripped clothing, not putting underarm pads in her blouses to hide the sweat um, stains, um, not caring about what she looked like. And yet when um, Lou marries Bert and he starts to make some money, she really began to understand that she uh, had a position to fulfill as the wife of a successful miner. She went to London to get her clothing fitted and designed. Her mother had sewn, and so I think that she probably picked up a certain amount of idea of dress design and um, what fit well from her mother. 
But I also would not be at all surprised if Lou to find out in some maybe missed archive, missed letterbox somewhere that Lou may not have had um, conversations or had what we would today call, you know, a personal dresser or somebody who was responsible or an image consultant, what we would call an image consultant to um, help her look as well as she did. And she had the money to buy and have designed the, the the most beautiful clothes you could imagine. And she was noted, by the way, for being an extremely well-dressed woman during her years in DC. It sounds like she filled the role of image consultant for, for Herbert Hoover, right? Very much so, yes. <laughs> um, how long did Lou Henry Hoover live in the Hoover house? And did, did uh, Herbert live there with her? So, I mean, technically Herbert lived there with her because he sure <laughs> didn't stay in the Herbert, I mean, excuse me, in the Hoover's version of Blair House when he came back to California. Um, her permanent residence would have essentially been from March of 33 to um, the end of 43 when she had written a, a will to her sons and to her sons. She pretty much knew that she didn't have much longer. She she was sick. She had heart disease. Um, it is amazing, by the way, the number of her contemporaries who had been involved with her with Girl Scouting, women who died of heart attacks. So we think about women and heart disease, and there it was, but nobody was picking up on it then. Um, so at least those 10 years would have been more uh, more consistent occupancy and just very, very sporadically but the, between the time she opened the doors in 21 and they left the White House in 33. She has extensive letters to Alan about how to pack things up and label things um, when Bert won the presidency um, for storage and the idea of letting the house. And um, I don't find a lot of material on just exactly how it was leased um, or whether she actually went through with that. Although people were staying in the house and she did hire people to be a host, host or hostess in the home during the White House years. Do you have any, in your research, did you uncover anything about um, whether Lou Henry Hoover was active in any campus politics while she was at Stanford? From what I'm able to see, most of her activities were um, typical of who she was, which was to join um, organizations that met her interests. Now, Bert was definitely on the political side of things when he was um, at Stanford. But um, Lou, from what I was able to determine, was um, way more of a, a uh, was more social. Um, she was more interested in uh, getting along with people. She had a the kind of personality where she could lead without being a threat. And um, that would have been more her style rather than to become politically active. She was essentially somebody who worked her politics behind the scene um through her actions um instead of being more in the out front realm on the political side well i think we have probably time for one more question um and this one actually relates to the lou henry hoover house if you um uh do you know anything about whether the hoovers took the furniture out of the house or what, uh, after it was given to Stanford? Um, was anything left there or uh, any details about about that? I know there's a, a concerted effort on over here to try to uh, put the story together, um, especially led by, by um, my colleagues across the campus. Well, unfortunately, I don't because um, Bert pretty much deeded the house to the university shortly after Lou's death. And um, whether or not I would suppose that that information would best, potentially best be uncovered with um, his correspondence with the university. And there may be materials in any correspondence with Alan Hoover uh, depending on where his his post uh, lose death archives um, potentially are, uh, or if there are any, um, because he had a 
been tasked by his mother, um, as I said, during the White House years to kind of keep an eye on what was going on with the house. So my my best guess would be that if anybody knew what had happened to it, it would be he. Annette, this has been just such an amazing um, presentation, learning more about Lou Henry Hoover and the, and the force that she was. Um, so we really thank you for your time and sharing your knowledge with us um, and for sharing your book with us. I hope everyone goes out and reads it, and I hope we can have you here in person um, on campus sometime soon. Well, I appreciate that. I'd like to come uh, on campus and uh, look forward to some seeing some of the things I've only read about as well as studying what you have and learning more about here. So thank you very much for the opportunity and thanks to all who participated today. Okay. Thank you.